thank you for coming. My name is Elizabeth Peterson. I'm the director of the museum, chief cook and bottle washer, as I like to tell everyone. And um, I'm very happy to see so many folks came this evening, and particularly a lot of students. Um, uh, not to single any student out, but I just heard that one of our one of our faves got into the Oxford Summer Program. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. So she'd be the one blushing in the back. Um, anyway, all these smart, smart students. Um, one of them, I, I was t I'm auditing a French class, and uh, one of the students said, "Oh, I love Dr. Rulison, but physics is terrifying." <laughs> so I don't know if I'll see him here tonight. <laughs> but a beloved, beloved professor here. Um, Dr. Michael Rulison has been with OU since 1982 and the chair of the Division of Natural Sciences since 2007. Um, he's got a, uh, an extensive uh, CV that I can't possibly keep in my head, but has done a great deal for, um, for this university. And I really don't know what he's going to talk about. Um, <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> it's really up in the air. It's up in the air. It's, it's changed, actually. Um, I also want to mention that a week from tonight, we have our final lecture for this show, Optic Chiasm and Blind Sight, and that will be with the artist Alan Eddy. Um, Alan's work is the beautiful, vibrant painting that you see on that far wall, and Alan is legally blind. He, uh, years ago, was a student of Marcia Cohen, whose beautiful work you see on this wall, at the Atlanta College of Art, and he managed to live through meningitis, regain enough sight, completely change his style, and come back powerfully with an incredible vision, despite a lack of vision. So that'll be our next lecture. Um, but without further ado, I'm Mike Rulison. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I, I want to give a disclaimer here at the beginning, and that is that I am neither an artist nor an art aficionado of any kind, but I do appreciate art. And so what I'm actually going to um, focus on tonight is how it is that I personally, and I think other physicists and other scientists, appreciate art, the reason that we perhaps appreciate it differently than other people do. And so uh, I think first a few general things, and then, and then we'll get into some specifics. But um, in thinking about this, and what I'm tr going to try to reconstruct for you this evening is sort of the journey that I actually went through as I came to appreciate art as I do today currently, which, again, is limited to say the least. But the world we live in is very deep, and what I mean by that is that um, we, we only sense, um, and partly because of our senses, we only sense the surface of it, or certain aspects of it, that are, and, and those aspects that we see are strongly colored by and determined by our own personal histories, you know, experiences that we had as children and growing up, the way we're trained um, in school. Um, and, and so, but there's a lot of depth below that that we see, regardless of, you know, what your personal experience, your training, etc. is. And we're limited, therefore, by, I would say, three things. One, and I'm going to address each of these as we uh, proceed tonight. So, one of those, of course, is our senses. And the second is our perspective. Now, perspective is something that I think is um, characteristic of, I won't say necessarily unique to, but characteristic of um, the time uh, that we find ourselves um, in, and, and also the, the civilization culture, the history of that culture, we find ourselves in. More about that later as well. And then the third thing I think is focus. So perspective, you know, has to do with sort of, you know, from, from, from what point of view do we, do we experience the world? But focus is what part of that do we tend to concentrate on? And that also can vary. So our conception of, of reality then is, is shaped by our senses and by our personal and cultural history. It's also restricted by those as well. And it's kind of the restriction that I want to focus a little bit on as we go along. So a famous quote that you'll all recognize, that the world is not only stranger than we perceive it, it's stranger than we can possibly imagine. And it's the different ways that we all imagine um, the world that differentiates the way that we, um, that we, that we see it. And that, that it, 
goes from artists on one end of the spectrum to scientists on the other. Right? So these results, though, um, cause a, there to be a, a really incredible potential, if you think about it. Because for the foreseeable future, because the world is deep, and we can only scratch the surface of it, maybe we scratch deeper as time goes on, both personally and uh, more collectively. But for the foreseeable future, there's going to remain a very, very mysterious, largely mysterious reality right, for us to explore, artistically, scientifically, any way you want to think about it. But we're going to focus on those two. So I think that artists and physicists, and I, I'm going to be a little bit uh, um, more restrictive in, in some of my comments. I am a physicist. That makes me a scientist as well, sort of by default. But I'm not a chemist. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a geologist. I'm a physicist. So we, appro we approach this in distinct ways, but they're similar. And, they're, and the similarities, when you really sit down and start to think about it, which is what I've been doing for the last three months in all my spare time, is what really is the connection? Um, those, those similarities actually are, are quite extensive. Um, what we do on, in, in both cases is we probe beyond just the experiences that we see, what we sense on the surface, by, by selectively choosing, filtering, uh, and interpreting what we see. And you might say, well, gee, you know, an artist, um, and, and I should give another uh, caveat here, and that is that most of my examples, most of my references are going to be to the visual arts, but of course I think you'll be able to see by extension that the, the points that I'm making I think apply equally well to music, to performance art, to any, any version of art. But uh, I think that uh, we both uh, come up then with valid ways of understanding the world, and hopefully those ways be become new and different and they evolve and progress. And so, sort of a one bullet point history of the world, right? Uh, at one point in the, in the uh, claim that I'm going to try to make to you that, that um, sort of establishes the similarity be between the way these two different types of individuals understand the world, there's an important role played by metaphor at one point. And those metaphors are, as I said earlier, determined by lots of things. Um, there are a few students in here who've had my core 402 class, and so you'll recognize the term control beliefs that I use a lot in that course. And so control beliefs are uh, something that very strongly influences the, the kind of metaphors that we can draw upon to try and understand the world. And what I mean by control beliefs is things, um, prejudices, or, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a pejorative way, but prejudices or preferences that we hold so deeply that we're not even aware that we hold them. Um, and we all have those. And they may be different, but by and large, they're, they're determined by the culture we live in, the time we live in, all of those things. So the metaphors that artists might have used in the medieval period and the, are shared with the metaphors that scientists during the medieval period would have used because they're both coming from the same period of time. And so they both uh, would, would have many of the same control beliefs. Now, how they apply those is obviously very different to art than it is to, to, to physics or science. At least it might seem like it on the surface, but I'm going to try to convince you otherwise as we go along. And at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about modern and how things uh, have both modern art and modern science and how they Things have changed, I think, um, certainly in the last century and even more so in the last few decades. So, a few examples. And the, the remainder of this really amounts to sort of examples of things that are shared by artists and by physicists. Um, what you have to do, in either case, is synthesize things, right? You have to bring things together into a coherent whole that is in some way coherent. Um, so in, in the scientific uh, case, a couple of examples spring to mind, uh, one of which I've tried to illustrate here. Um, the Newtonian synthesis. So Newton, back in the day, probably didn't actually sit under an apple tree and have an apple fall on his head, but the story's nice. Um, 
But what he synthesized, what he realized, was that an apple falling from the tree is really the same thing as the moon falling around the Earth. It's gravity that makes both of those happen. But that's a, that's a huge synthesis, isn't it? I mean, those seem very, very different. Falling apples and things, you know, moons or satellites orbiting the Earth seem very different. But in fact, if you just think about it for a second, you can convince yourself that, in fact, they are the same. So if I dropped an apple from the top of this tower, it would fall straight down. But if I threw it a little bit sideways instead, it would follow a path like this, right? And if I threw it harder, it would go farther before it hit the surface of the Earth. Okay? And in principle, couldn't I throw it fast enough and hard enough so that it falls at the same rate that the surface of the Earth falls away? And I'd put it into orbit. And that's the moon. They're the same thing. But achieving that synthesis was the thing that Newton was able to do. How? I wish I knew. Right? But, but I think by doing some of the things we're going to talk about as we go along. Uh, more recently in science, there's been what I'll call an inner space, outer space synthesis. And that is the realization that our understanding of the physical world on the smallest scale, understanding things like quarks and electrons and Higgs bosons and gluons and stuff like that, has a profound, inextricable link to things in the very largest scale, the whole universe, how it began, how it evolved, how it's going to evolve into the future. Those two things, you can't talk about one without the other, we now realize. But that's a recent realization in another synthesis. In the artistic case, a couple of examples uh, spring to mind again. Michelangelo, I don't think that he really differentiated in any way between architect, architecture, interior design, engineering. He just saw them as all different aspects of the same thing. Um, throw in a, well, somewhat musical example, but uh, <laughs> Wagner uh, and Gesamtkunstwerk, right? Uh, he mentions that a in a couple of, of papers that he wrote and actually tried to do it a little bit with his ring opera. Um, the idea was to bring various forms of art together into a single unified whole, right, to synthesize, um, uh, as I said, there are various aspects of it. So that synthesis is one thing that has to be done uh, to produce either a successful scientific model or theory or to produce a successful piece of, of art. Creativity, uh, an obvious one. Um, I think pretty commonly, if, if, if I were to ask everybody uh, to take out a piece of paper and write down four or five characteristics of an artist, I think everybody's list would probably include creativity, right? So it's commonly understood, but I think it's less well appreciated in some other areas, in the sciences and the physics. And um, part of the reason is this damn thing, <laughs> okay? The scientific method. How I wish that term had never been that uh, every grade school and, and middle school science textbook that you pick up has this on the first three or four pages, right? And the only thing that's missing here, I might add, is what's implied is down here there's a last block that says, go collect Nobel Prize. <laughs> because it gives the impression that, okay, all I have to do is ask a question, and then I do some research, and I construct a hypothesis. If I go through these steps, I'm guaranteed, guaranteed, that I'm going to make it an important discovery. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Uh, it doesn't work that way at all. Um, and I understand that the idea here is to try to, you know, to, to try to break down the scientific method, the process by which this is done, into a, a set of distinct and chronological and related steps. But it really does not work that way. And here too, I want to try to give some glimpse of what I think is a more accurate way of thinking about this. So we experience the world, right, in some way. We, we sense the world. And here's the thing. Our left brain is a bully, okay, compared to our right brain. The left brain, which is responsible for linguistics and largely for sort of ordering things that we perceive, um, it bullies the, the right brain. And it establishes coherence on the things that we sense, even when that coherence may not be there. Now, of course, there's a reason for that. And it's, it's, a, 
with an evolutionary reason, and that is that, at least earlier in our history, we didn't have time to think real carefully about what we were sensing, because if we did, it would eat us. Uh, and so, as a result, um, our senses, and this is what I was referring to earlier when I say that our senses, yeah, they're really useful, and certainly, if you look in the other galleries at the experiences of some of the individuals who have lost parts of one of those senses, you can appreciate this. They're really useful, but they also are constraining. Because what we sense is processed by largely the left brain, unfortunately, most of the time. And like I said, what it does is it, it tells you, oh, uh, here's how you make sense out of what you're seeing. Useful um, for survival um, purposes and things like that, but not very useful for being creative. Not very useful for understanding that deep world that I talked about on the first slide. Right? Getting below the surface requires something more. So there are, you know, dominant, these are the dominant ways we think, you know, is, is the, the usual way of perceiving the world and reconciling our sensory input. You know, it makes sense how we say either I need to run really fast or that thing's going to eat me or everything's okay or something in between. Um, but there are other modes of thinking that are there. It's just that they're overwhelmed by these, by this one. It's kind of like being in a some sort of an environment where, like out by, out by Peach, okay, during rush hour, all kinds of noise. Now, there may be a bird sitting in the tree chirping nicely, but unless you absolutely focus on that and intentionally draw your attention to that bird, you don't hear it. What you hear is all the other mess. Okay? And so, I, I was joking with, with Bill Trosher a minute ago, that there are three groups of people that are really good at doing that kind of thing. Theoretical physicists, artists, and drug users. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think that's right, but you know, um, you may have it. So there are these others, but they're over there. And so um, the last point here would be there's this question um, is the way to be creative, to be single minded and extremely focused, or, or not, or the opposite? And yeah. There are examples, I think, on both sides, right? I think that you can give examples of both. I'll give you the, the one example I, I want to mention to you because it sort of illustrates both at the same time is uh, a famous mathematician by the name of Henri Poincaré um, had actually developed a way that worked for him of suppressing these dominant ways of thinking and letting one of those lower level modes of thinking come to the fore. And what he did was he would concentrate very intensely for extended periods of time on the question he was trying to solve. And then he would do something like read a book or get on the train or take a walk. And he accounts many, many examples of times when it's then that the inspiration struck him. Not when he was extremely focused, but when he then re released or relaxed that intense focus and then the other ideas could come straight in. Now, that's the, certainly not, I'm not suggesting that everybody do that, but haven't we all had a great idea in the shower in the morning? Right? You know, it's like, oh boy, that would be great to do that. I think that's the same. So, here's kind of my uh, take on how this works, whether uh, from an artistic point of view or from a scientist point. There's this, what I'm going to call intellectual space out there. And um, to illustrate what I mean by that, let me use Einstein as an example. Einstein, when, in the few occasions when he would talk about his creative process, and he was loath to do that for the most part. Um, but when he did talk about the creative process, he said, the last thing that I do is uh, use linguistics. That's the last step. And he felt that he had to do that because he needed to explain his theories to other people or to write them down in the book. But he said that's the last thing that happens. What happens first, for him anyway, what happened first was he said, I imagined symbols, mathematical symbols, 
that are moving around relative to each other. So symbols in motion. Now this sounds pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the way that he was able to take ideas that were sort of floating around in this intellectual space and not well formed and not well organized and, and, and at that point not even capable of being described in words. But he could see the relationships that existed between these symbols and then comes, that's the, sort of the easy part. And then the hard part is how do you turn that into something that other people can understand? Um, I'll give you uh, another example. Uh, Picasso said, I paint things as I think of them, not as I see them. Isn't that interesting? Right? So he's doing the same thing. He can see what he wants to do, right? The idea. But that's not the same thing uh, as, as what you could put into words. Okay. Um, authors very often will tell you, that book that I finally wrote has been in my mind for five years. There are no words yet. But the, the idea is there. So all this stuff I'm saying is in this intellectual space. It's kind of a platonic, you know, primordial place where ideas exist. And then here's the hard, well, first step in the hard part, right? You know what you want to do, but the question is how do you do it, right? What metaphor can I use to make real this idea that I've got? And in, in the case of artists, I think it would be fair to say they decide on things like what the form is going to be. What are the artistic elements that I'm going to try to use? Right? Things like hue and, and light versus dark and direction line and things that sort. For scientists, we make models. And usually those models are expressed in the form of equations. Okay. And then this is the part that Einstein was describing that he really didn't like, because sort of at this point, from his perspective, I'm done, right? But now I've got to come up with some way of communicating this to other people. And what do we end up with? We end up with a new piece of art, but we end up with a new physical understanding. Now, um, those metaphors that we use, this is the thing that I was trying to uh, claim earlier, they depend what's available to us to use in making this very crucial step. Um, they depend on where we are, the time we are, what our own personal history has been, things of that sort. To give you an example, but again drawn from science in this case. When Darwin published his first edition of On the Origin of Species, he used two different metaphors. One was the one that most everybody who's heard of this theory familiar with. That's the tree of life, right? This branch in the species as time goes on. But there's another one in the first edition where he uses a metaphor of a wedge, a bunch of wedges being driven in from the outside. And some of those wedges are able to drive in, and in the process of doing that, other wedges are expelled. Now, if you look in the sixth edition of his book, that wedge metaphor is nowhere to be found. Because although it was something he was trying out, it didn't work. Right? It didn't work for conveying the idea that he was trying to convey. So the tree metaphor continues, but the, um, uh, the wedge metaphor is So what we're trying to do then is to find some kind of coherence, find meaningful patterns in the jumbled, this jumbled mess of what I called in the first slide, the deep world. Um, and that meaning, uh, again, is affected by these constraints or conditions um, that are placed upon us when we decide what kind of a composition we're going to do, if it's an artistic piece of work, or what kind of a model am I going to use to try and explain this physical phenomenon. Now, again, I'm not an artist, and so I've never actually had this experience with a piece of art, except, well, maybe I, in kindergarten, you know, when you put the macaroni on the thing and take it home, and your mom goes, oh, that's great. Right? Uh, but, I understand, and I, and I know what this feeling is, not in the, in the sense of art, but that a piece of art has to work, right? In other words, it, it has to have certain qualities, right? It has to be aesthetic, it has to, you know, all these various things. A scientific theory, this sounds a lot it's more sterile, right? A scientific theory should be consistent with what we already know. 
It should make predictions. And you have to be able to falsify it, right, if it's going to be a scientific theory. You can't just throw something out there that can't be tested, because that's not science. That's something else. Um, but, you thought the slide was there. But no. Uh, there are not purely as uh, scientific aspects of a theory or a model. And these are the important ones, really. Is it elegant? Now, I'm not saying that there's a test that says, oh, the theory must be elegant. But a rule of thumb, if you look back at the history of the development of scientific theories is, if they're elegant, and really only a scientist or a mathematician knows what I mean by that, you can look at an equation and say, that's beautiful. Right? I know that sounds weird. Uh, but just in the same way that somebody can look at a piece of art and say, that's beautiful. Right? There's something about it. There's an elegance to it. There are examples that are at the other end of the spectrum. It's ugly. I'm going to show you some ugly stuff. In this. It should be conceptually simple. Um, you might think as we learn more and more about the world, and we get farther and farther into that, what I call that deep world, that things would become more complicated. Actually, the opposite is true. Things become conceptually simpler as we find out more and more about how the physical world works. And so, maybe another way of saying the same thing, there should be an aesthetic quality to a scientific model of theory. Okay, here's my example. Again, Core 402, people I apologize, you've seen this before. So prior to Copernicus, back in the, uh, up until about the middle of the 15th century, the understanding of our local part of the universe was that the Earth was at the center the various planets went around the Earth, including the Sun. And they, this is what Ptolemy's model looked like. And I think it'd be fair to say, I mean, it depends on who's doing the viewing, but from, from my perspective, that, that's our view. Um, Copernicus comes along and he changes one thing. He puts the Sun in the center. He puts the Earth in orbit with the other planets. Most people don't realize, most people think, oh, Copernicus's model is the sun's here and then there's the planets in these nice circles. Not at all. That's what his actual model looks like. Now, there's not a nickel's worth of difference between those two. The only thing that's different is what's in the center. But otherwise, Copernicus's model is just as ugly, as non-elegant, as non-aesthetic, as Ptolemy's model, even though we now know that in some sense it is more nearly correct. But the fact that this remains ugly is made clear when we look at what a close successor after Copernicus did, Kepler. He just changed the orbit shape a little bit, so they're not circles, they're ellipses. And now it looks like that. Now that's elegant, right? Let me back up. None of this multiple circles and everything, nothing's centered on anything else, and it's a mess. <clears throat> That's elegant. And with that elegance comes an increased understanding. Okay? Now I would claim that the same thing happens when an artist uses the various forms and the various artistic elements that I've decided to combine together. Now, I'm gonna, I apologize for what's coming up here now. But, <laughs> so I knew what I needed and so I, I, I Googled bad art. <laughs> and there's actually a gallery of bad art. So, you know, take your pick. There's lots of bad art. I picked this one because I thought it was particularly heinous. <laughs> I mean, there, there's something sort of interesting about a carrot giving birth to a rabbit, I guess, you know. But, but it's ugly, I, I, I think. I mean, maybe somebody disagrees with me, but to me, that, that's not good at all. That is. That Renoir is elegant. Okay. And it's, you know, if you compare the two, it's not that, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if anybody needs to leave the room. Uh, it, it's not that, you know, the elements that are being used, they, they both use lots of different colors, and, you know, there's sort of a, a balance to the thing, and so on and so forth. But one is clearly way better than the other, right? Aesthetically speaking, elegant in terms of elegance. Okay, so how do we actually go about doing this? Artists use things like hue, color, 
thickness of the paint, right? Uh, light and dark, uh, shadow, things of that sort. Those are the elements that they then have to, and the real problem is how do you combine those into something that is elegant, aesthetic, and so on and so forth. What do we use? Well, we use as our design elements uh, things like, oops, sorry, back, things like this <coughs> and some more. But what we use to understand the physical world and out of which we build then something that hopefully ends up being aesthetic, et cetera, and with increased explanatory power is conservation laws, conservation of momentum. Right? So that MARTA bus, when it hits that VW, right, it's not good for the VW. And that's because of conservation momentum. Well, conservation of angular momentum, right? Uh, figure skaters at the end of their routine, when they typically start with their arms out like this, and then as they bring them in closer to their body, they spin faster. Conservation of angular momentum. Conservation of energy, we're all familiar with. But the thing that is of interest here is that each of these conservation laws, and there are more, I just picked three, uh, each of these is connected with a particular kind of symmetry, it turns out. So the reason that linear momentum is conserved when that MARTA bus hits that car is because space is homogeneous. Right? Home and I'm going to show you what I mean by these terms in just a second, but homogeneous means every place is like every other place. Right? So it doesn't matter whether that MARTA bus hits a car out here or a couple miles down the road, because those points are basically the same. Um, angular momentum is connected with another kind of symmetry, isotropy. All directions are the same. There's no difference between this direction and that direction. Now, you should be saying to yourself, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. I'll come to you. Just bear with me. Energy conservation is connected with the fact that things don't vary with time. There's a time invariant. Um, that, that, that exists. So here are examples of a couple. What you see here is homogeneous. Because that looks the same as that. Right? So these two points are the same. There's really no difference. On the right, you see isotropy. Right? All the directions are the same. But is this, does this have isotropy? No. There's clearly a difference between the distance and this direction, right? And does that one have homogeneity? Is that one homogeneous? No, because out here the lines are farther apart, and here they're closer together, so those are not the same. Okay. What's she doing in here? This is a, a, a famous German mathematician from the early part of the century, Emmy Nether, who said, clever that every continuous transformation, right, moving things in space, changing direction, moving things in time, and anything else like that you can think of, every transformation that you can think of corresponds to a conservation law. So there aren't just the three I showed you before. There's a whole boatload of these things. <clears throat> I want to give you one example of how that has been used in science to make a deeper understanding of the physical world. So it was known for a long time, and this is just one example, but it was known for a long time that certain materials undergo radioactive decay, going all the way back to the late 1890s. And so here's an example. Carbon-14, it turns out, if you sit around and wait long enough, it will decay. It will give off a beta particle, which is really just an electron. And then the carbon turns into nitrogen. So Physicists, scientists were well aware of this for a long time. But something was troubling about this because it turns out that if you compare the linear momentum before and after, the angular momentum before and after, and the energy before and after, they are not conserved. Okay? They are not conserved in this process that's shown here. And so these uh, conservation laws are so deeply held, okay, and I know that's a dangerous thing, given what I said earlier about control beliefs and things that we don't challenge, but these ideas are so deeply held as being somehow fundamental 
to the way the universe works, that uh, Wolfgang Pauli in 1930 proposed that, you know what, there's actually another particle here which we're not seeing. And what that other particle does is it then does cause momentum, angular momentum and energy to be conserved. So he hypothesized a particle that and it came to be known as the neutrino. In 1930, 26 years later, in 1956, that particle was first discovered. But in that intervening 26 years, even though there was absolutely no evidence for it, the belief that that particle would eventually be found was held by the, the majority of the people. Uh, and that's an example of how these design elements that we have available to us, when used the right way, it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that in every situation these things are conserved, and that's what we're going to come to in just a moment to kind of wind things up here. But um, it does mean that if you use these in the right way, it can in increase your understanding of the physical world. So here's what that actually looks like. The carbon turns into nitrogen. Yes, there's the beta part of the electron, but there's also this neutrino. There are some constraints placed on it. Remember, uh, I said there are three things, basically, that sort of we have to wrestle with, them, whether as artists or as physicists. And they are our senses, our perspective, and our focus. What about our senses? This is kind of a strange pair of photographs, but I'll explain what the story behind this is. But this is a picture of the sky. This, this is a, a, a picture taken in, in Ottawa, Canada. And, uh, it's a picture of the night sky, but you'll notice there's very little you can see there in the sky. And that's because of the light condition. Well, here's what happens if you remove uh, the light condition. So in August 14th of 2003, there was a massive power outage that affected about 50 million people in the United States and up into Ottawa in that area of Canada. And this is, the, this is the same house, obviously. A little, just a slightly different angle. But it's the same house during a normal night and then this during the blackout. And so dramatic was this difference that people were actually calling the police department and saying, there's this weird white cloud <laughs> in the sky. It's the Milky Way. Right? It's the Milky Way. But in which of these cases are you going to figure out something new and deeper, a deeper understanding about the universe? That? There's nothing to see, right? I mean, there, there's nothing to make sense of. But here, ah, now that's something that asks to be explained, right? Um, <clears throat> moving along. So, I claim that those three conservation principles that we looked at a moment ago um, were based on three symmetries. Homogeneity, right? points looking the same. Isotropy, different directions looking the same. And time invariance. Why do we believe that? Well, one of the reasons we believe it is because our senses have been extended um, by things like telescopes, microscopes, all kinds of technology. So here's a little... Uh, image that shows, looking out from where we are, which is right there at the center, in two different directions into space, what the universe looks like. And this is the relatively nearby universe, actually, it turns out. But having said that, let me point out to you that each of those dots that you see on this thing is a galaxy, not a star, an entire galaxy. So each of those dots is roughly 100 billion stars. So you're looking at a lot of stars there. But the point is that if you look out this way at the universe, and you look out this way, they don't look that different, right? I mean, okay, I know, I know that you know, there are people say, well, there's nothing there. But the point is, this direction doesn't look any different than the other direction. So the universe is isotropic. It doesn't matter what direction you look, it looks the same. It's also homogeneous, right? So. Um, you know, you pick any little chunk up, let's say up here, and you just measure cutting a square out, and you say, does that look any different than a square down here? No, not really. So it's homogeneous as well. And 
you get a twofer here in the case of <coughs> astronomy because a telescope is a time machine, right? You look through a telescope, you're not seeing those things that you're seeing through the telescope as they are now. You're seeing them as they were because it takes time for the light to get to us. So, stuff right here, that's the recent universe, right? Because those things are close by and it doesn't take light very much time to get there. These guys out here, that's a long time ago. So, not only does the universe look the same in different directions, not only is it homogeneous, so that it looks the same at different points, but it also shows that third one, time invariance. Things don't look different in the recent universe, right in here, than they do in the distant past. So that's why we believe that those symmetries underlie the physical world, is because that's what the universe is telling us, is that it's isotropic, homogeneous, and has time invariance. That picture that you just looked at is this. But our technology now allows us to look much farther out up to here. Let me skip over the uninteresting little thing. So this is the really distant universe, way back. And my point in showing you this is that that, that, uh, that trend or, or that property that I showed you on the previous one doesn't end if you look farther and farther and farther out. So in other words, none of these directions look different. This direction looks pretty much the same as this direction. This little patch right here looks pretty much the same as this little patch. This looks about the same as this. <coughs> so those three symmetries that, uh, that, we, that we believe underlie the physical universe are revealed to us by the universe itself. Okay? And that's why those symmetries and those conservation laws that I talked about are so deeply held is because of this evidence that presents itself to us. So there's a picture that, uh, this is called the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, so the Hubble Telescope, and it looks out as far as it can. And we're talking about, actually, up to about this distance right here. And that's looking back about 11 billion years into the past. That's what the universe looks like, or what it looked like 11 billion years ago. Now that doesn't look all that different than if we took a picture of the nearby universe, the way it looks today. You want to look even deeper, this is called the, you're running out of adjectives, this is called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. <laughs> That's looking even farther, it's looking out here at about 12 billion years ago. And it doesn't look any different either, right? And 12 billion years into the past, this is getting back close to the beginning of the universe as we currently understand it. The Big Bang happened about 13.7 billion years ago. So this is looking most of the way back to the beginning of time. It doesn't look any different. So here we are. Here's where the Hubble deep field is. Here's where the Hubble, I didn't show you that. It's close so Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and then the Extreme Deep Field is right at the very bottom of the planet. And before that, the universe actually does get different, because now we're getting back to it very close to the actual beginning of time. So there weren't galaxies, because they didn't have time to form yet, when we go back to those very early times. Um, let me skip over this, because this is the real point I want to get to. So I've been emphasizing symmetry, right? And that symmetry is important, at least to us physicists. But symmetry, in spite of the fact that the universe is telling us that it's got all these symmetries, homogeneity, isotropy, time invariance, symmetry is sterile. You don't get any understanding of that. Let me try to convince you that I knew more. Um, I, I apologize for going through this. But these are the two important things. Symmetry, I, I claim, denies access to information. Not just in a physical understanding of the universe, but also in a piece of art. If it's perfectly symmetric, it's not interesting, right? It's not interesting. When the symmetry is broken, 
that breaking of the symmetry reveals information to us, both in terms of the understanding of the physical universe and in terms of a piece of art. It's the deviations from symmetry that make that painting there interesting. Right? If it was perfectly symmetric, you'd go, hey. I don't know from first-hand experience, but I imagine this is the terror that an artist faces. Right? A blank piece of canvas. Why? Because it's, it's symmetric. Right? It's sterile. There's nothing there. There's no information there. Anybody ever had vertigo? It sucks. Because what vertigo, vertigo does is it removes your ability to tell the difference between up and down. Right? You, and your world becomes symmetric. And that's why you fall over or you can't stand up because you don't have that broken symmetry that we ordinarily have, which is gravity pulls me this direction, so I know which way down it is. Okay. That's my attempt at showing the bird on. Can anybody tell what that is? Oh, it's a dot on the canvas. No, it looks like a light it's actually a photograph. That's a little flag. This is at the South Pole during a whiteout. Now imagine being there, and imagine that that flag weren't there. It's your world becomes totally symmetric, right? except for the fact you can feel gravity pulling you down. But in terms of direction, I, I got no information about what the right direction to go is. Divers, if anybody is a diver, you know that you can get yourself in a bad situation diving as well, where you because of your basically weightless, you can't tell which direction is up or down. And what you do is you blow bubbles, because the bubbles will rise, and then you know what direction is up, right? But see, blowing those bubbles destroys the symmetry. It breaks the symmetry. I stole this from gravity. Um, <laughs> but astronauts experience the same thing. Right? They, the world becomes the universe for them, becomes totally symmetric, and they have no idea of what direction anything is, there's no information of it. So you do that, symmetry's broken, right? Now there's some information. This is more interesting, I think. Again, you can disagree with me, but I think that is less interesting than even that stupid thing. There's a ball. There's more information there now, right? Because of that illumination. I know now. That I can't tell what's what. I mean, I had to shade it a little bit because otherwise it would look like a circle. So I'm just trying to show that this is a, a ball. But the fact that there's this patch of bright here tells me there's a light up there, right? So you, you break the symmetry and all of a sudden there's more information. Ah, there's a light up to the right, even if it wasn't going in. Now there's even more information, right? Because this tells me not only is there a light up here, but there's a surface here because there's a shadow. Right? So each time you break a symmetry, you get more information. And the thing and you have a deeper understanding of what's going on. And you have a, a, a more complex and more interesting, I think it would be fair to say, um, picture of what's going on. Of course you have to be careful with the shadow thing, right? You probably all see mm -hmm. this, but you know, at first glance, you see these big black camels, but then you notice that what they really are is shadows of these actual camels here, because the sun is very low on the horizon. So you, look, you don't look at that too carefully. You say, oh, I understand what's going on there. But you've got to be careful. There's information there, but you've got to interpret that information. And I searched for a long time to find this one, but I think this is really great. Can you tell me, is that the right one, or is that the right one? The only difference between these two is I, I, I took and just flipped the image upside down. Is that, is this the real bird and this the reflection? Or is that the real bird and that the reflection? Any guess? The real is on the bottom. This is the real one? Yeah. So in this picture, that's the real one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nope. <laughs> that's the real bird and that's the reflection. But you see the symmetry there, again, right? In this case, it's mirror symmetry. The symmetry denies us information about which of those birds is the real one. Now, 
the reason I had to hunt for so long is because typically when you look at a picture like that, there'll be some ripples on the water, and you say, ah, that's the water. So you really have to hunt to find one where the water is so still that you really can't tell the difference between the two. As soon as we break the symmetry by there being some waves down here, then I, then I have information. I know this is the real bird. Mm -hmm. You may recognize this, but the, the sort of the final point here is we get this information then, right, by breaking, by, by having broken symmetry. So either in the case of the physical world, we, we, we use these conservation laws to try and understand what, what the basic elements are, but then the trick comes in how do we put that information back together to produce a useful model or a theory, right? You have to pull things apart and then put them back together again. And if you put them back together again the same way that they were when you pulled them apart, you haven't gained anything. Right? Same thing with cubism, I think, to my understanding, right? Is you take something, you chop it up, and then you reassemble the parts. And this is, in, in a way, more interesting than the guy before he was taken apart and then reassembled. So the symmetry here, again, has in some sense been destroyed, but in the process of doing that, we get a more interesting or a, a, something that's laden with more information than it was before we Uh, a couple last examples. This, is um, this you'll also recognize um, when I give you the bottom half of this. Mm -hmm. So if you think about what's happened here, this is actually a superposition of two photographs, right? So this is first just catching this drop as it falls, right? And it's perfectly symmetric and it's falling. So, you know, if I back up, really you can't tell except for the fact that we're used to it. You know, down being on the bottom, but you can't tell what direction is up or down there. Right? But I know what direction up or down is here. Why? Because the symmetry has been broken. And you, know, you get this crown, it's called a crown swatch. Right? And there's still symmetry there, isn't there? But not as much as there was up here. So this thing is symmetric because it's kind of circular. But it's not as symmetric as the drop before it hit when it was spherical in all three directions. Uh, I talk about the Higgs boson kind of thing. But um, going back to the universe, um, the universe also, if it didn't have stuff in it, and the universe without stuff in it is like the blank canvas. The universe would be really boring, okay, if it didn't have stuff in it, because it would be like this part back here. Despite the fact that it's made out of Einstein's, but it, it would be it would be perfectly flat and featureless and boring, right? But the real universe is more like this here, because it turns out that stuff in the universe, like planets, black holes, stars, galaxies, they destroy the symmetry again, right? They warp the space and time, and that warping is interesting, right? And it tells us something about how the universe works. This tells us nothing about how the universe works. This does. And um, what I know. No, this is good. I'll finish all this. So what has happened, I would claim, and I know my focus has mainly been on sort of the astronomical and cosmological part of physics. That's because to get into the elementary particle aspect of it or some other aspect, it requires a lot more you know, sort of background information to understand what I'm going to be talking about. But the universe, we're all familiar with. You know, there's stars, there's galaxies, there's stuff. What's happened to the universe is that it started out extraordinarily symmetric right after the Big Bang. This is a very recent picture. It's only uh, an image. It's only about three weeks old. And anybody that does follow science that's in the news at all. There was an announcement of a discovery that was made going on almost, almost a month ago now by um, one of two groups that's operating at the South Pole and they're operating a telescope that's called BICEP. And what BICEP is doing is looking way, way up past those galaxies we were looking at. Um, it's looking at, this is the heat that's left over from the Big Bang itself. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. And that's been known for a long time, going all the way back to the 
early 1960s. But what's new and interesting is that we've been now able to measure these little black lines that you sort of see superposed on this orange and red thing, is the polarization, again, just another feature of this radiation. They've been able to successfully measure the polarization of this radiation that is coming to us from right after the Big Bang. This is like a, an extreme baby photo of the universe. This is what the universe looked like, or representation of what it looked like, 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the beginning. So that's a decimal point with 35 zeros and then a 1. The universe was that old when this information started coming toward us. And isn't that just, in, isn't that insane? <laughs> that, that I can actually say that and, you know, people don't actually, at least outright laugh at it. With that, face. Yeah, with a straight face, right? That we actually know something about the universe when it was 10 to the minus 36 seconds old. And there it is, it's a picture of it, right? So fast forward 13.7 million years. The universe today is kind of like that, right? It's not symmetric. But is it more interesting? Probably. Right? Because the universe today, as those symmetries have been broken, as we go from the earliest times up to the present time, break this symmetry, break that symmetry, it becomes more interesting, it becomes more complex. In physics lingo, the entropy increases. But this is way more interesting because one of those little dots in there might be the Earth, right? The sun with the Earth going around it that has interesting things like people and dogs and trees and stuff like that, right? And that's a long way from that mass. I mean, they're, they're both interesting, and they both have information, but different kinds of information. And, um, but I think my last claim would be that I think what artists try to do, whether they be visual artists, musicians, performance artists, is to take something that is nothing, that is symmetric, there's no information there, and to, from their own using their own senses, their, pers their perspective, and their focus to break the symmetry that exists. And in the process, make something interesting, complex, and um, artistic, I dare say. So that even, you might even call that a piece of art if you know better, right, of some kind. And if, I, if that weren't a photograph, if I could paint that, that would be a piece of art. Right? Um, so I think there are a lot of, simi uh, a lot of similarities, like I said, between uh, physicists and scientists in general, and artists. And I tried to look at a couple of the things, and, and again, I w just want to finish by going back to the, my original point, which is, this is just my take on how, this, how I came to understand the similarities between what artists do and what a, what a wonderful piece of art like that has to do with what I understand, and so this is back to the title of, of the talk, that how the art you see depends on the physics your brain knows. I can't look at that piece of art without thinking of it from my perspective as a physicist, and things like symmetry and breaking symmetry and stuff like that inform the way that I understand that painting. Each of your understandings, of course, is different. But um, I think I'll leave it at that. And I thank you for your kind attention. I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>
which is all the stuff I've been talking about. So I don't, I don't think any of us, you know, and not special in, in, in any way in this sense, none of us can divorce our perception of things that we currently and what we look at from all this stuff that we've accumulated up to this point in our lives, right? Our experiences, our training. What, I, what I've been trying to focus on here is the training, right? So I've been trained as a physicist, and that makes me look at the world in a certain way, with certain tools. And I can't look at other stuff without using those tools, unless, like I said, theoretical physicists, artists, and drug users. I'm not going to use drugs, so I'm going to have to look at things, um, you know, from the, from the perspective of the Yes, Could you say something about the relationship of asymmetry and entropy? Yeah, so uh, the more symmetric, uh, the more symmetry a situation has, the lower its entropy is. So the universe, when it started out, because it is so symmetric, it has very low entropy. And as it evolves and becomes more complex, en entropy you can think of as sort of a, as a, as a proxy or a synonym to the complexity of the elements. And so as the universe has evolved and become more complex, its, its entropy has increased. So what's the difference in, between asymmetry and entropy? That's, that's, maybe that was a better way of saying my question. But you're using the word asymmetry in a way I haven't heard you really use it before. Yeah. Entropy would have been what I would have thought you were talking about. Yeah, I, and the reason I, I, I would have preferred to use that as well. It's just that I don't think it's more pointing. So, whereas symmetry, I think. Well, how do you define entropy then? Well, it is, the, it's, there's a technical definition for it, but basically it is the amount of disorder or randomness. That's what I've always understood the name. And, and I know you might say, well, gee, that, that picture you showed, it was the first picture, the one before this, you know, that, that hot, dense early universe was very, very chaotic and random, right? So it's flying all over the place. And that, that image that was yellow and orange and so on. But the fact that stuff is flying all over doesn't change the fact that it's very highly symmetric. And by, by that I mean pick two different points in that image. Instead of talking about it, you just go back to it. Pick two different points in that image. Um, now, granted, polarizations like the black lines do kind of pick out certain directions that are different, but if you forget about that for a moment, does the left part of this look any different than the right part? Not really. Uh, does one direction look different than any other direction? Not really. So it, it's symmetric in the sense that, it, it, in that sense, even though, so this has low entropy and a lot of symmetry, and then when we go to the universe evolves, its entropy increases, it's more disordered now, right? Here, everything that will eventually be the universe, right? That will be you and me and the, and the sun and the earth and everything, everything's here all together, right? In one place, kind of mixed together. That's not the way the current universe is. Everything is not all in one place mixed together. Stuff has separated out, it has become more disordered. So its entropy has increased uh, when we go to this situation here. Am I yeah, please go. Um, <laughs> we're all fascinated by this last statement. So is it fair to say because of those three rules that that these various portions of the universe are experiencing entropy in the same way and that they are consistently changing, losing symmetry? Mm -hmm. at the same rate, in the same manner, and why do things become elliptical? Uh, why do galaxies become elliptical? Why do they become elliptical? If everything is um, at a consistent rate? I didn't, I, I didn't claim the rate was the same. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lawyer my you know way I'm out of that You know I'm a non-scientist of this. I'm a scientist, right? Um, All right. Yeah. No, the, the rate has... The rate has definitely changed. It's changed. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so, and again, if we had a semester, boy, we could have a good time. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, should take your course. <laughs> yeah. But we now understand that the way the universe has evolved, it, it's, it's changed at wildly different rates. So that right after that first picture, um, 
the universe underwent a period called inflation, when it inflated by an almost unimaginable factor. And, and then it slowed down, and it's been kind of expanding, but kind of more or less coasting at a much more leisurely rate for most of the last 13 billion years or so. But then something else started to kick in a few billion years ago. I'm going to toss these billions around. Yeah, a few billion years ago. The universe started to actually speed up again. And it's now uh, the, the rate at which the universe is expanding and evolving and so on is actually accelerating rather than slowing down. So the universe is literally flying apart right now, faster than it was earlier. And, uh, but see, all of that, I mean, back to kind of my central point, the way we've come to understand that right after the beginning it inflated it very rapidly, and then it slowed down and coasted, more or less coasted for a while, now it's speeding up again. How do we know all that? By employing these tools, conservation of momentum. I know it sounds mundane, but you know, by applying rules like energy should be conserved, momentum should be conserved, and so on. And that combined with, and, and we cannot deny the importance of the astronomical, no pun intended, astronomical development of technology in the last decades, right? So these things like the Hubble telescope and so on and so forth have taken our eyes and basically extended the reach of them to the very edge of the visible universe. And it's like drinking from a fire hose, right? There's so much information. We're, uh, cosmologists and astronomers are bombarded by, so, and, and physicists generally, because of things like the Large Hadron Collider over in Europe, you know, giving us information about things on the very smallest scales, particles and so on. There's so much information that it really is almost more, well, not almost, it is more. We need more physicists. There's not enough of us to try and figure all this stuff out, right? But it's a nice problem to have that there's so much information. But applying these rules, these what I call design elements of physical theory, to, to, these, to this ever-increasing body of sensory uh, input that we have is what's allowing us to make ridiculous statements like, that's what the universe looked like 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the beginning of time. It's really interesting, right? And so remember the, the comment I made on one of the first slides. The, it's mind-blowing, right, how um, much potential there is for increasing our understanding of the universe by just continuing to do what we have been doing. The human race has been doing this ever since the beginning, right? trying to make sense out of the world around us. It's just that it's like all of a sudden we have super eyes and super ears, and you know, we've got more sensory information than anybody has ever had before. And in a sense, the, it's kind of like we're, we're being overwhelmed on us by uh, the amount of information that we have to try to make sense out of. Yes, please. Is time symmetrical or asymmetrical? Well, that's a really good question and a difficult one. It depends. On the, on the microscopic scale, on the quantum scale, uh, time is symmetric, so go forward and backward in time equally easily, in a sense. But on the scale that we live on, right, on the macroscopic scale, time has a directionality to it. Right? Um, we have no choice but to go forward into the future. Right? So we're, we're time travelers, right? It's just that we're traveling forward in time. We'd like to be able to travel backward in time. But, uh, so on, on the macroscopic scale, on the, on the human scale, there definitely is a directionality to time. And the forward direction is the way we have no choice but to go. The backward direction is inaccessible to us. But if you look at things on the very, on the quantum scale, where you're talking about individual little particles, is there any difference between them going forward or backward in time? No. Where that one directionality of things on our scale comes from is from the sheer complexity of the, of the fact that on our scale, things consist of such a huge number of those individual elementary particles that, you know, the, the old saying that the sum is greater than the, that, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's true, it turns out, it seems. Um, we look at the parts and they seem to be able to move sort of with equal uh, ease forward and backward. But when you put all those pieces together to form a whole, uh, that, again, 
based on what our current understanding is, that, that possibility does no longer exist. We, we can only go forward. Please. What is the status of string theory? Oh, boy. <laughs> the question is the status of string theory. Um, my opinion, take it for what it's worth, which is not much. Um, string theory is a nice, it, it's a really slick, elegant idea. But the problem is it fails at the current time one of those critical test that a scientific theory has to satisfy. And that is that it should make, the way I worded it there was actually a little bit too broad, a theory should make unique predictions that then can be tested. And here's the thing with string theory. There are so many different versions of it that some version of it will predict any damn thing. And so it's not testable. And so, you know, that may be an artifact of the fact that we're in the process of, you know, string theory. In modern string theory, there was a much earlier version in the earlier part of the 20th century, but uh, modern string theory has only been around for, and seriously considered for maybe 20 years, 25 years, something like that. So that statement that I just made may be an artifact of the fact that we're still just kind of bumbling around trying to figure out what it, how it works. But something in here tells me it's not right. Yeah. Now that, <laughs> you should take with a huge grain of salt, but that goes back to that thing about uh, conceptual simplicity, aesthetics, and, 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 uh, and, and beauty, uh, in a sense. Something in here tells me string theory isn't right. We'll see. I know that's not a satisfying answer. It, it is my opinion, and it's not anything more than that. Yeah, please. So I was kind of curious how you know your your central tenet was kind of the relationship between symmetry and sterility yeah. takes into account kind of generative symmetry. I feel like there are a lot of things, you know, like something as simple as like a sine function or a kind of generative homogeneity in fractals. Um, yeah. Or even, you know, like in human beauty, like we're, we're always trying to find symmetry out of asymmetry. And That's we, true. And we kind of find that beautiful, right? Yeah. And then, I was curious how, how you thought that well, actually Yeah, it's a good question, and I agree with each of the points you made about, you know, any number of psychological studies that have shown that if you, you know, for example, if you show people pictures of different faces that they would generally regard the most symmetric face as the most beautiful as well. So there is an aspect of, there can be an aspect of, of beauty associated with symmetry. But I think, um, I don't find that inconsistent with the claim that I'm making because those symmetries are only beautiful or meaningful or profound in the context of surrounding asymmetry. Right? If you see what I mean. So if there were if there were only symmetric things, right, then there'd be that would be again a very uninteresting situation. But the fact that most things in the universe, especially as it exists today, now you know, things early times were different, but in the universe today, it's a very asymmetric universe today because it's it's evolved to be that. And so in an in a universe that is largely asymmetric, then symmetric things are actually quite unique. And I think maybe it's the uniqueness more so than some more metaphysical you know, meaning of beauty, if you, if you see what I mean. And I, I confess, that's, I thought about that question myself as I got to the end of this. Like, well, you know, I really kind of like symmetric stuff. I'm the kind of guy that likes symmetry. I like things to be where they're supposed to be and stuff like that. And, and, uh, so I, I contrived this right, account of why it may be that in the universe today we, we do regard symmetric things as beautiful, but by comparison with what the bulk of the universe is, which is asymmetric. But I still would contend that in terms of information, okay, in terms of information, symmetric 
things don't convey as much information as asymmetric things do. So if I'm in that whiteout, boy, I, I, I want that symmetry to be broken so I know which way I should go, right, because there's information. So I think that the, the information content is a different thing from the more purely aesthetic notion of beauty. I don't think they're necessarily inconsistent with each other. Please. Uh, I'm curious about one thing, which is that you've left out affect both for scientists and for artists. And it, there are ways, like for example, Bruner would say that science is looking to predict, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that art is looking for verisimilitude. It's trying to describe what the experience of being alive now, what our human experience is. Mm -hmm. And in both of their, if it, for most artists, at least as far as I know, there is a very strong affect. There's some disorder that they go to their art form to create order out of something that feels chaotic. Mm -hmm. And for scientists, there's something inexplicable that they go to create a model that will help make, explain something that up till now is inexplicable. Yeah. That's very human. That's a very human drive for both of them. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that they, you just, it's satisfaction is that it becomes symmetrical. You judge your theory by the fact that it's parsimonious, it's elegant, it's symmetrical intellectually. Mm -hmm. And you, in the art, you do something the same. Yeah. Not necessarily the image, but it matches something in us that speaks to life or to our own experience. Right. So. I think um, the, the comment that just pops into my head, so it's the one I'll give you, is that a let me use an equation as a quick model, whatever you call it. An elegant equation, while it has symmetry and has all those things, the interesting thing about it is that in spite of the symmetry or the elegance of the equation, when you actually apply it, it can describe such a wide range of different things, each of which is its own different thing, right? So um, Newton's laws of motion. Right, very simple, you can write them down in three lines, they're conceptually simple, and they have you know, all of these different properties. And yet, in spite of that simplicity, that elegance, that symmetry, when applied, they can explain lots of very, very different things. 